No, they won't give you back pay and they won't let you just take off. You have to have a hangnail. All right, Leon. Leon. Leon's not here today. Mitchell. Mitchell, I'm going to be talking to you specifically on this stuff, okay? Okay. Braun. Braun actually didn't show up. Reinhardt. Reinhardt, if he can't answer the question, you know, if he looks, if his eyes roll up in his head, then you must answer for him, okay? All right, this is a short review. There's a question of when you should be using single story out of that table that shows single story columns only. Those are for if you really have a single story frame. They're good enough. They work nicely. They're certainly much quicker than using the G's. If you really had a single story thing, you could still use the G's on it. For a pen, you'd use a 10 in the G. You wouldn't say this is fixed because you'd have two beams coming in and a single column coming in so it would have a G. You can use that. But for single story things you use that table where we just have the single story stuff. Do you remember the table number on that? Doesn't matter. They, they probably know. What, what page is that on? 16.1 dash 511. That's that table. But for multi-story things, you can't just you can't use those K's. Uh, you got to use G's on everything from then on. Now we think maybe there's a homework problem where it's uh, just a single story and they use G's anyway. Well, that's acceptable. It's just more work, so they don't usually do that. This particular one here was if the end is fixed, you get a one. I know you could theoretically get a zero, but they just don't like that idea. They don't believe you. They do have a thing in this is if you have theoretical proof that you really have a smaller number, you can use it, but it goes in with your other calculations. And if it's pinned, you ought to be using an infinite, but the truth is a better number is a 10 for you, and it is permitted, and it's really almost impossible to get something really pinned, so it's safe. There's the, where those notes come from. The one we were working with had a couple of, had a member, column AB, had some supporting girders, good guys, supporting girders, good guys, some bad, one bad column coming in at the top, two bad columns coming in at the bottom. We wrote down the moments of inertia out of the tables, and here were the lengths so we could quickly calculate G. Now, this is not the same frame, but it's typical. The solid ones are the, uh, f the members in the plane of the paper. There are some other ones back here. <clears throat> they have some bracing on the sides and no bracing as you look through the building in this direction. Incidentally, this thing says uh, members are oriented so that bending is about the strong axis. And the reason why is the architect <coughs> wanted windows in here. <coughs> and so he didn't want any bracing. We told him we'll have to weld all this stuff up. The members will have to be quite a bit stronger because now then your wind loads are going to have to get down to the ground through these moments. They, say, they said it's worth the price. Yes, sir. Sorry, I can turn this on, but <coughs> kind of hated to. I don't know if I can holler any louder. I don't know why I have to do that a click at a time. There we go. Hello, hello, thank you for telling me. Hello, is that okay? Does that make a difference? All right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the reason why is when you put the wind loads on the side, all the forces have to go through these members. 
So this is a top view of the way that column is positioned. They're all positioned so that they get bent about the strong axis. So here is a similar case. You'll notice there is the member if you looked at it from the top. Here's the member if you look at it from the top. Here's the top flange. There's the bottom flange. There's the web if you look at it from the top. All of them in the front and the back are all situated like that. Now, well, you may say, if you load it from this side, why don't we just do the same thing? Just get the strength about the minor axis. This is really difficult to get the strength you'll need for wind loading about the minor axis. So whether they like it or not, somehow or another, they're probably going to have to put bracing to stop member D1 from moving back into the board. And they do that with the bracing. If it wants to move back, it throws this member in compression. That member in compression puts this member in tension. Then the load gets back down to the ground. And member uh, point D1 doesn't move significantly to the back. Yes, sir. Tubing is fine for columns. It's not popular. It's not easy to connect to. You say, why don't we just weld it? Well, yeah, you can weld it, but uh, the walls are pretty thin. Uh, when you're talking about a wide flange, here's the top flange. Here's the bottom flange. Here's the member coming in from the side. It's pretty easy to weld it onto there. And then if you need to, you can throw another plate and weld it to the web to get that force on through to the next one. Tube's going to be a problem because you're going to have to get a little bitty guy to go up in there and weld a plate inside that tube. So they're not as convenient. Okay, uh, this is a picture of what this column A kind of looks like. You know, I don't have the ones going in the back. But basically, somebody's coming in here, it's welded nicely, coming here, welded nicely, coming here probably just goes all the way across the top, or it could be welded nicely. There can be plates in here, and very likely may have to be, to get that force in the flange on through into the web rather than bending the flange. Here's one down here where they did. They just said, look, it's going to be pinned. It's not going to be fixed. It's not going to be a moment-resisting connection. As you'll notice it's just sitting onto a bolted angle, so it's just pinned on the ends. Here's joint D3 is seen from the top. Here's your column. You'll notice I told you that it was situated that way. The flange is on the top, flange on the bottom of the web. This one is a moment-resisting connection, <clears throat> so it was welded nicely. This one, there was no real strength about this axis anyway, so they just put an angle in there, bolted the angle to the web, and bolted the, uh, the beam to the uh, angle so it won't fall off. Now this is what it looks like, weak axis buckling. In other words, this is the same column. The weak axis is about this axis, so I'm going to show you that this column went back into the paper. I know it, it may look like this is right, left, right, but it's not. If you look closer, it's back, forward, back. Say so there's no difference. Well, you've got to see the difference. It's buckling about the weak axis. This piece of the column is coming out of the plane of the paper. This piece of the column is moving into the plane of the paper. And this is basically pinned, pinned, so it'll basically be a 26-foot column. This will be a 20-foot column. This will be a 14-foot column. That's KL, about the weak axis. Now, about the strong axis, I don't know. I've got to have all my Gs and get my act together on that. But here is strong axis buckling. In this case, because you didn't brace it, this moved to the right. It didn't move 22 feet or anything, you know, greatly exaggerated. It moved a couple of inches. And then this isn't really perfectly fixed because there's a G at the top and a G at the bottom. And the columns coming in and the supporting girders coming in influence the G. And the same way with this one. But this column, A0, A1, has moved to the right in the plane of the paper. 
I don't know where to write that down. And then this one buckled, and you see how that's kind of buckled like that? This is a nice pin, and but this supporting pair of girders kind of brought it back up vertical, but not quite. And I need a G at the top and a G at the bottom to tell me effectively how long this column is. And then I guess that's the same picture. So our solution to the original problem, before we got off on that tangent, we had supporting and wanting to buckle people, supporting not wanting to buckle versus people wanting to buckle with their eyes. Here were their, here's this, here it is right here summarized. Here are your eyes and your links out of the table, 171 inches to the fourth, 12 feet long, 171 inches to the fourth, 12 feet long. This one was 20 feet long and 18 feet long. So, bad guy coming in, 171 over 12. It's only one of them. Two good guys trying to help you out, 88.6 over 20, plus 88.6 over 18. Gives you 1.52 for G on either end. You can enter this GB or GA, doesn't matter. Then for the other end, you have two 171 bad people coming in, causing you two times grief. Then you have 199 over 20 and 199 over 18 for a 1.36 for the other ends, G. Then the alignment charts. Uh, here's the alignment chart. What is this? This is an unbraced frame. Uh, that doesn't say unbraced. You know, I don't know which one this is. Which one is this? Unbraced or braced? How do you know so quick? Uh, it says uninhibited side sway. That is right. But I don't remember exactly unhi uninhibited, what that means or not. Could you tell from the picture? See how this moved over to the side? That's an unbraced frame. Not one of these that's braced. So we enter the two G's that we get. We find out what the K is, 1.45. We multiply the true length of the column times 1.45, and that's its effective length. That's if it's elastic. Now, once we get into picking columns, we're going to have to see whether or not the column is elastic or inelastic once you take a first shot at what the column ought to be. If it's inelastic, we, we get some relief from this grief about how long the column is. It's really a little shorter. Uh, so here he gets this. He gets the 1.45 that we mentioned a second ago. So our lambda is KL over R, our K out of the nomograph, a 12 foot long column, 12 inches and a foot, the radius of gyration for the column that we tried. See, he is proposing a 10 by 33 column. Got 199 inches to the fourth. Uh, well, I'm looking more for the length here. The length is 12 feet. So there's his 12 feet times 12 inches and a foot divided by the radius of gyration about the strong buckling axis, 49.83. We have a personal break point on, there's a familiar number, 50 KSI steel of 133, 113. So we are well to the left of, 40, of 113. So we are in the inelastic region. So we have yielded fibers and so those fibers are not as potent as they say. When this column wants to buckle and he starts feeling popping out to the side just a little bit, he told us that he was a beast. He was going to ro roll that thing whether or not we liked it or not. Since it is so highly compressed, before he really gets around to even testing buckling, he has a bunch of fibers that are yielded. The minute he just starts to roll, those outside fibers yield, and he no longer is as effective at buckling as he says he is. Now, you don't have to take that into account if you don't mind spending a lot more and getting a lesser grade, of course. But if you have a 
uh, slenderness ratio down in this inelastic region, you get a tau. Now here we go for the factored load. I take his word for it that that was his dead and his live. We find that the, nom the stress in there, the piece of you, how much stress would really be in there, would be the load over the area of the shape is 27.79. And you can go through the equations, nothing wrong with it, except we have a set of tables for tau, tells us what this stress will do to a piece of, I'm trying to see where the stress is, A992 steel, 50 KSI steel. And it says uh, the tau is 27.79, 27.8. If you go list that in the tau, he'll tell you exactly the appropriate tau that you should be using. 27.79, you can interpolate, or you can take the worst one, the one that doesn't let you shorten the column as much. Turns out if you interpolate it, you get 0.988. You're only going to pick up 1.2% shortening on the length anyway. It's hardly worth anything. Here's where things get good. If that column was a little shorter and holding up a lot of load, or if it was a little heavier column, where the stresses in there were pretty low because it was a bigger column, then you might not, you could multiply those G's by 0.59. Multiplying those G's times 0.59 would bring you way on down, down below a 1.4 or whatever we got. I guess that's the right picture that goes with what we're doing. So for 0.988, he says you get 0.9877. I agree. Therefore, the elastic G, which is what the tables, or what the uh, equations are good for, these equations are only good. You'll notice E tangential and E normal are not in there. To turn the elastic numbers out of your uh, tables times tau will give you the inelastic G. And so instead of having a 1.52, you get in or a 1.5. I don't think you can hardly put it in the table that close. And this one is 1.36, reduces down to that. And he says from the alignment chart, you go from a 1.45 uh, to a one point. 3.4? No, oh, 1.43. Now My guess is he didn't really get that out of the table. My guess is he got it out of the equation. Remember, we had an equation for tau. It's just a con the table, the, the picture was convenient. But you do get some reduction. Now then, he says, very short, because the support conditions normal to the frame, K sub Y can be taken as a 1. Whereas we talked about this case right here, where we are now studying buckling about the strong axis. That's where there's our G values, our G values. Talking about what happens due to this load being applied to this column about the weak axis also has to be checked. That was weak axis buckling, and weak axis buckling was back into the page, out of the page, back into the page. See how that's pin pinned, pin pinned, pin pinned. See how strong axis buckling, double did that one go. See how strong axis buckling, that's not pin pinned. It's not even fixed fixed. It's something in between. A G kind of guy. <clears throat> now that's as far as he takes it. He <coughs> hello. Make sure that thing's still working. <coughs> he could go ahead and find out how much load the thing will take. Check it out, but he, that's as far as he carries it. All right.
Torsional flexural buckling we don't cover. So that's everything we got to say about columns. For beams, <coughs> you're going to need to know your 221 stuff where you first learned shear and moment diagrams so you can get the moment diagrams in these structures. You're going to have to also know your 305 work where you reviewed shear and moment diagrams so you can still get the maximum moments and also things like MC over I for bending stresses. In 305, we limited you so that no fiber got stressed above the yield stress because our equations fell apart, including the MC over I equation. It, was, it required that the fibers stay within F sub Y or the equation failed or it came apart. Bending stress, used to use this symbol, we'll be using this symbol now. It's a little hard to get used to, and sometimes you look at this and forget what it is, but it's the symbol for the actual bending stress in the beam when you apply a moment to it. C equal to M over I over C, C equal to M over section modulus, we use the section modulus a lot. Uh, all of the notes you ought to read through here. This is what it does. This is what the chapter is for here, where you'll find that information in the uh, specifications. Here is the same equation that you and I wrote down earlier, <clears throat> except you wrote down P sub U has to be less than or equal to P sub N and then because you couldn't guarantee me that was the number I was going to get, you said, okay, well, I'll, I'll drop it down an appropriate amount so that I cover and can guarantee you, you will get this. This was called the design load. This was called the ultimate request for load. I believe the, the specifications wrote that down, P sub R required. <clears throat> because they wanted it to go for allowed stress people and for ultimate stress people. and But we never used it because we don't ever do allowed stress. This is what P sub R means to us, means P sub U. Then they had a different equation for their, I think they used a, some kind of a thing looks like that for their factors. Here is a typical beam. can either have them rolled out of steel, they roll them for you. If you can't get one big enough, you can have one made. Uh, these things will be subjected to uh, uh, moments. The moments may do bad things to you. Among other things, the whole shape may buckle, but instead of buckling like this, they buckle like this. You've probably felt that happen. You take a yardstick, you support it on both ends, you put a load on it, and you just can't. In other words, when the thing is standing up, you can't get the thing to fail. Uh, every time you try and push down on it and try and break it, it pops over to the side. That's because the top half is in compression. It thinks it's a little column. And so the little column goes over to the side. And the bottom piece is in tension. He doesn't let it go too far. He says, what is your problem? He says, I don't know. I just wanted to pop over to the side. Also, the flanges themselves may, in, in our case, we, we run them right up to the limit. <clears throat> the flange may buckle. Remember I showed you flanges buckling in columns. They can also buckle in beams. You will be wanting to know how far this thing sticks out. That will be B sub F divided by 2, one on each side. And you will want to know how thick it is because that's what keeps it from buckling, thickness of the flange. So you'll need numbers like that out of the table so that you can tell the tendency 
for a flange to buckle or for the whole column to uh, the whole beam to buckle. Bending stresses and the plastic moments. What we do is is we will have a beam. Here it is from the side. You will put a little bit of moment on it. See that little bit of moment? That will cause some compression and it will cause some tension. This is F sub Y right here. You'll put some more moment on it and you will do this to it. That will be what we call first yield. Then you put some more moment on it and this little fiber here says, I've had it. I'm, I'm through. I can't take any more. I won't dump what I've got like a glass beam would, but I can't take any more. First thing you know, the stresses will look like this. Then the stresses will look like this. And then all of the fibers will go into the yield range. And then that's the limit. Not really the limit, because as you know, here are all your little fibers now. You got some more, but there's nobody willing to take that part. So we're going to have all the fibers reach F sub Y, and then we're going to give it up. If you go in this region, you get so much deformation, the beam just isn't hardly useful anyway. Although it's there if you need it bad enough. Uh, beam, loads, find the moment. Uh, stress at this point, if you wanted it, stress at the maximum point was where the fibers, the furthest from the neutral axis. Bending stress equation. Here he's showing you what I was just talking about. It's got a concentrated load with a moment on it. At 100 kips, here's what the shape looks like. And the stresses are, this is 50 KSI. The stresses are at 30 KSI. And uh, some of those little fibers are up here at 30. Some of them down here are down here at 15. Some of them here are down at zero. Run it up to 167 kips, and you get the yield stress on one fiber only. That's called first yield. Put some more load on there. The stresses start evening out at F sub Y, because as you put more load, you cause more moment. These fibers said, I'm not taking any more moment or stress, so they had to dump it off to the fibers below them. This is where we're going to work. <clears throat> We're going to have every little fiber working for us to the full extent possible. Same picture. Here C is F sub Y. Here's fiber A, B, C. Here's fiber A's current stress, B and C. As you reach first yield, fiber A reached 50 KSI. Fiber B is at two-thirds of 50. C is at one-third of 50. Put some more load on here. Now then, fiber A has reached yield. Fiber B has also reached yield. Fiber C is trying to escape. He sees it coming, but he can't get away. Finally, A, B, and C are all on this flat part. And uh, I have everybody at F sub Y, full plastic moment. Now, you can't do that too many times. The truth is we don't ever expect it to happen. It probably won't happen. It's never happened to this building. Been here, I don't know, 100 years, never happened. Probably won't happen now because it'll probably happen to the building next door first. It's in the way. So if tornado comes, that's their problem. But if it did happen too many times, it'll... It'll fail. Or if it even happened once, there was a building in Dallas got hit by a tornado, and it didn't fall down, but it was really twisted. It was really bent out of shape. I don't know what they did with it. Yield moment is the moment at first yield. Plastic moment. Is equal to the moment at all fibers. equal to F sub Y.
kind of what happens when you look at the beam. <clears throat> this is true. This is next load kind of true. This is incorrect because there's, there's no way that you really get these stresses. You can't get beyond M sub Y. But what happens is, as you put more load on it, a longer portion of the beam starts getting yield stresses uh, as opposed to the earlier loads. So what happens is, when you put a little load on it, it just deflects like you and I are used to seeing in our 305 problems. Once you start getting up where this yield moment is, has occurred, you get a little bitty kind of a kink, not much. First thing you know when you really reach a significant portion of this thing has reached the yield, then you get a big old kink and you get very excessive deformations. Uh, are you supposed to know how to get an elastic neutral axis? I'm going to show you a beam where it has fully yielded. Here is a beam that is fully yielded. It started out with an applied moment. The top thing was 25 and 25 KSI and linear down. This got to 50 and 50 and linear up and down. Then this one stayed at 50 and this one went up to 50. And this was half of 50 and zero. Then this one went up to 50, 50, 50. And this was half of 50 and this was zero. And finally, this is 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. Now, you never get this little piece here, really, but it's not worth worrying about. It's so close to the neutral axis, I'm not counting on much moment from it. Here's your stress diagram for the way you and I are going to do business. F sub y on the top area in compression, F sub y on the bottom area in tension. Looking at it from the side. Now, it looks kind of like they got the area in the top equal to the area on the bottom, but I don't care. Uh, if your shape really looks like this, then you tell me how much is in compression. I'm going to yield it in compression. You tell me how much you got. I'm going to yield it in compression. You tell me how much is down here, and I'm going to yield it in tension. And I'm going to tell you that stress and compression, F sub I and compression times that area, plus that area times F sub Y in compression, minus this area times F sub Y in tension, equals how much? Zero, because otherwise it goes down the road. It's not in equilibrium. If you don't have this compression force in the top, whatever that area in the top is, equal to this tension force on here, then, you're, then the beam is not in equilibrium. Oh, pretty picture. Happens to be a wide flange. Got a compressive stress all on the top. Got a tensile stress all on the bottom. The distance between the centroid of this shape, whatever it is, I don't care, you should be able to find it, and the centroid of this one, wherever it is, that's where the compressive load is centered. Here's where the tension load is centered. I don't care what this is. We should be able to solve for it. Whatever that distance is, either one of these times the moment arm between them, this is a couple, this has to equal this, that either one of them times A would be the plastic moment. Now, since the compression force minus the tension force has to be zero, so the two forces have to be equal. Since the compression force is the area in compression, I don't know what it is. I don't care. I think I can find out. Times yield is equal to, I don't know what's left, but that's the area in tension times yield. That says the area in compression has to equal the area in tension. That didn't used to be the case. It used to be the case when you solve for the elastic neutral axis for this thing here, you didn't, it didn't have 20 times 6 equal 20 times 6 and the neutral axis was there. It was somewhere down in here. And I'll show you an example. 
But since the area in compression is equal to the area in tension, if you say my beam is a 20 by 6 and the web is a 20 by 6, that beam, once we're doing business, where all the fibers are plastic, that neutral axis has to be here. So that the area in top, on top, times the yield in compression equals the area on the bottom times the uh, Area on the bottom times the yield stress in, in tension. Without that being there, again, it's not in equilibrium. Here's a case. See, I knew where the plastic neutral axis was on that one because 20 by 6 and 20 by 6, that's easy to do. Here's one that's 20 by 6 and 20 by 2. Now, I don't know where the plastic neutral axis is, but I see you took a lot of this area off, so I know I'm going to have to go on up in there and pick up some area so that this area that's lightly shaded is equal to this area that's heavily shaded down in here. Because the two areas have to be equal. Here's how you should remember how to solve for an elastic neutral axis. Draw a reference axis at the base, how far it is to the elastic neutral axis was A1, Y1 plus A2, Y2 divided by A1 plus A2. Here are your calculations if you have forgotten. Here's the plastic neutral axis. Since this is a 12 by 2 and a 12 by 2, the plastic neutral axis is 12 inches, moved up from 9.5 inches. As you were yielding the fiber, the, the neutral axis was moving. Final position, right there. Is your backup ready to go? Is he? Okay. Is he sleeping? No? All right. I can't see from here. He's got that hat on and he's behind. Uh, there he is. Okay. Okay. Uh, for the built up shape, determine the elastic section modulus S and the first yield moment. And the plastic section modulus, that's what we call the plastic section modulus. The elastic section modulus is listed as S in your 305 book. The plastic section modulus, this is, yield, this is listed. The plastic section modulus is listed as Z. First off, here is the elastic neutral axis. It's in the middle due to symmetry. Here's the plastic neutral axis. For a wide flange, it's in the same place. Not because of Y1, D1 plus Y2, or A1, Y1 plus A2, Y2 plus AY, 3Y, all that stuff. This is in the middle because this area is equal to this area. Yes, sir? None. Because you and I are going to crank that rascal right up to plastic no matter what. I don't care where it started. It's ending up where A1, A top, A compression is equal to A tension. I mean, he may not like it. He'll scream and holler, but I'm going to pour it on. Uh, here are the calculations for the moment of inertia from your 305 work. You should, of course, be able to get that. You will have to get that sometimes. Sometimes you'll need to know the elastic neutral axis and the elastic moment of inertia. The reason being is sometimes the, re, the requirements in the specs call for this number not to be, some number not to be exceeded, and you have to still be able to do it. The elastic section modulus is I over C. Check it out. And the first yield moment, the moment at first yield, would be F sub Y times the elastic section modulus, 446 kip feet. If you're an elast, if you're an allowed stress person, that's probably where you're going to stop, with a, some factor of safety associated with it. That's the first fiber that screamed, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, and everybody brings a little ambulance and say, well, don't hurt anybody else. We don't do that. Answer is, elastic section modulus was 107, 305, 446 kip feet. B, because it's symmetric, a on the top is equal to the area on the bottom, so we don't have to do much work there. What we do have to do is we have to make every fiber go into compression 
to f sub y, and every fiber on the tension side go into tension at the uh, below the plastic neutral axis. Now he solves for the centroid of the shape, and then solves for the force. He takes eight times one multiplies it times the stress. Then he takes this one times the stress. And then he adds those two forces together and gives it a moment arm of how far it is from there to that centroid. That's really a lot of work. I mean, it may show you something. I'm not sure. But let me just go on down here and, and let's talk about this. He says, he, he calculates the distance between the centroid of a T and, of course, the same centroid on the bottom T. He calculates where the centroid is, and he tells you how much area there is, and he multiplies the area in compression, uh, the total area, the whole shape over 2, that's the area in compression times A, that gives you that force times this moment arm, and then he's got another one, uh, A, this is A over 2 times A, that's right, that's the distance between them. It comes out with a, what they call a plastic se section modulus. Now that's the first time you've seen that calculated. And just let me show you uh, what makes a lot more sense to me. Let me make sure this is the same one. No, this is a different one. Well, that's okay. I'm going to refer you to him to calculate Z. He calculates the centroid of a T. He calculates the centroid of a T. It's already got it from this one. And then he multiplies uh, the area over 2 times the distance between them. <coughs> Same calculation. It says 5, 1. Is that 5, 1? Turn to find out. This is his 5, 1. He's got an 8. Let me see what 5, 1 looks like so I can... That is 5, 1. That's 8 by 1. Oh, this is a different one. Okay, that's okay. So I do have the calculations for him. <coughs> <coughs> There's his shape. There's my calculations. To get Z, all Z really is, is he's taken this total area times the distance to the combined centroid. That's the same thing as just taking this area times the distance to his centroid plus this area times the distance to his centroid. That's how you found the combined in the first place. So this is what Z is. Z is equal to 8 times 1 times 6 and a half. That takes care of the Z for the top flange. Plus 6 times a half times Halfway up is 3. And this is, I went ahead and multiplied it times 50, but that's Z for the top half. You want both halves, you need another one on the bottom. <clears throat> if you multiply it times 50, you're going to get uh, the 50 KSI in there at this time. You know, you still have to double it when you get through. Here is your z over 2, a1y1 plus a2y2. Here's f sub y for the top half, 61 inches cubed times 50 ksi. I guess he was calculating the moment. And then if you want both halves, you've got to have 61 times 50. There's one on the top and one on the bottom. Gives you a z for the entire mess, 61 times 2 times 50 gives you the moment. That is what he's calculating. That's M-plastic. M-plastic 
is Z for the shape, your plastic section modulus times F sub Y. See if I got a little piece of paper here. Here's a new shape. This is 2 inches by 6 inches. This is 12 inches by 1 inch. Where's the plastic neutral axis? Back up, back up. Back up, back up. Well, no, where is it? You are, tell me where to put the line for the plastic neutral axis. That's correct. Why is it located 12 inches from the bottom, 2 inches from the top? Because here on the top is 12 times... 12, and the air on the bottom is 12. This is Z for that shape. You can do his way. You can find centroids of things. Z is equal to 6 inches times 2 inches times 1 inch. That's for the top. Now, the bottom doesn't look like the top, but it's the same idea. It's how far it is off of the plastic neutral axis. It's one inch wide, it's 12 inches deep, and how far is it centroid from the plastic neutral axis? Six inches. That's Z. If this is a piece of 36 KSI steel, <clears throat> then M plastic for that shape, six times two is 12. What does this all add up to? 72 total? 84, thank you. 84 inches cubed times 36 kips per square inch. And do you have your calculator still going there? Thank you. 264. This should be bigger than that, shouldn't it? 2024? 30. Two four. Okay, that's inch kips. Divide that by twelve for me, if you would. Two. Well, oh, maybe that's what he already told me because he knew that's what I was going to be looking for. Kip feet. Just that easy. Now you can do those centroid things like he's doing, and I think he thinks you understand it better that way. But the truth is, this is a force and compression on the top which is this area times the yield stress. This is an area on the bottom. If you wanted to find centroids, you could multiply 6 times 2 times 36. That gives you this force. Then you multiply this area times 36. gives you that force. The distance between them is 7 inches. That's what he's doing. And you'll get the same answer. But I think this is just a heck of a lot quicker. That's all you and I are allowed. There is more available because the stresses still could go up to F ultimate. But we just, that's beyond our safety. We just don't feel safe with that. All right. See you next time. Yes, sir. In the calculations, we had two different equations to calculate the design strength of a column. Of a, That's right. We had a break. We had um, resistance factors. Thank you.
So the ultimate 0.75 and then the reason factor for the uh, yield for 0.9. I think you're talking about members that are in tension because all the columns have the same fee. So now you're talking about whether or not you were talking about gross section yield, which is pretty easy to predict and pretty reliable and doesn't have a lot of variation, 0.9. Or if you're talking around holes drilled in things, causes a lot of variation, in which case the fee was 0.75. Okay. So we were allowed to do use the ultimate strength. F sub y. F sub y times the area affected. Uh, no, times the area gross. For the ultimate. Now uh, you used F sub y times the gross area. Right. And you were permitted to use the ultimate on the area net or area effective because it was such a short little piece it didn't have a lot of deformation in it so we didn't didn't care too much about that we had to make sure it didn't break breaking was such a serious thing that we made you use a 0.75 on it okay but again it was for um it was, well, in the case of beams, beams are long, right? So we can't go up to the ultimate? No, the, we, we'll talk about that later. Okay. But we haven't started yet. The truth of the matter is there are some places we'll let you run certain things up to F sub ultimate. Okay. Probably around maybe the ends where they're in shear, something like that. That's what I was going to ask also. Like, uh, looking at the stresses, the equations that we're looking at now are good are good for inside the beam, but what happens at the connection point where you have now... Connections are designed separately. Okay. Totally different item. Right. Chapter 8, maybe? Okay. Take a look in the book. Okay. See, where they're, sure see where they're at. If we have a welded connection, you're only welding... You're not welding the entire area. The other part, so. Now... Oh, there. It's coming up. Okay. Dr. Lowry, we just yes, have a plastic sir. moment at the end there. Would that be multiplied by the 0.9 for a design? Before you get to use it, yeah, this is going to be nominal. Okay. Sure. All right, so this is... I, you can, but I'm not going to, I've got to get this put together.